Hi, this is Ash Whitener. And this is Justin Blinko. And welcome to Liberty Entrepreneur's Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. On January 21st and 22nd, we attended the North American Bitcoin Conference. We left with a number of amazing interviews, and we're excited to share one of them with you today. Please help us out by following us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Also, it would be great if you could subscribe and rate us on iTunes. There will be a link in the show notes and on our website. Our guest today is Patrick Byrne, an American entrepreneur, e-commerce pioneer, and CEO of Overstock.com. In 1999, Byrne launched Overstock, which initially sold surplus and returned merchandise on an online e-commerce marketplace liquidating the inventories of at least 18 failed dot-com companies at below wholesale prices. Overstock.com was one of the first large public companies to start accepting Bitcoin as a payment method in 2014. Much of his focus is now on the cryptocurrency space, where he is pioneering the sale of digital financial assets such as corporate bonds and stocks using blockchain technology. Patrick, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. It's an honor to be here. So in 1999, you created Overstock.com. Tell me, what pain did you see in the marketplace or society that gave you the idea to start Overstock? And give us just a brief uh, background on what Overstock is. Well, that's a great way to understand entrepreneurship. You figure out something some way people aren't being served well, and then you figure out a better way to serve them. In this case, manufacturers end up with excess inventory, and they sell uh, the excess inventory back 20 years ago was being sold through uh, odd channels, either flea markets or through uh, sort of stores on the wrong, in the wrong part of town, the, the discount to you, electronic stores and stuff. And it's just that the manufacturers have to have a way to liquidate their excess. And so we uh, realized, gee, the right way to do that is pull it all together, put it online, put it in a warehouse in Salt Lake City, put it online, and blow it out that way. And back then, were there any, was there anyone doing this? Did you have any competition, or did you pioneer this type of you know, distribution? We pioneered. There was no one else in this. Actually, there was a company, and um, they're not around anymore. I won't, I won't say their name, but there was one other group who started within a year or two of us. I remember some of the people's names there. I don't actually remember the name of the company. It was a good, it was a, uh, well, there was a guy named Tom Petters up in uh, Minnesota who has since gone to jail, as I recall, and uh, he's sitting in jail for a life. Uh, but no, it's kind of the, a weird little edge of retail, the bada bing, bada boom, I know a guy who knows a guy kind of fellas. So people, so companies would have this extra stock and they would look for ways to sell it because, I mean, you don't want goods just sitting and collecting dust. And they would use flea markets or some not very easy to find methods to, to sell this merchandise or for other people to buy this merchandise. Tell us how Overstock changed that. Well, we made it. It used to be that you there were several layers between that excess and it reaching the market again. And we made it so we just bring it into a warehouse in Utah. We put it up on the internet and blow it out directly to you. So it's, you know, it basically takes, we save over about 10, well, 10 to 15%, we think, versus Amazon on most products. And so talk to us about when you started accepting Bitcoin. I mean, you were one of the first companies to come out and accept Bitcoin. Back then, nobody had heard of Bitcoin for the most part. I mean, Bitcoin's still a small niche type of community. But you came out very publicly and very early to accept Bitcoin. What Was that because you saw a pain? Did you see it as a technology? Or how did you start accepting that? I really wanted to understand the blockchain and the technology that underlies Bitcoin. So a good way to start was start accepting Bitcoin itself. But the pain I see is I see a lot of instability in society and in the financial system. And I, I'm an Austrian economist by you know, my, my preference. And I think that the current fiat money-based Keynesian magic money tree system is doomed to failure. I think it's all going to collapse. And out of the rubble, those of us who have, been, who have built an alternative financial system based on true ownership and one-to-one, no hidden fractional reserve banking scattered throughout the system, 
uh, that's what's going to survive. So do I feel like I'm in a race to that, like we all are, to get this blockchain-based alternative financial system developed and robust, or maybe for the current system, Chernobyl's. Right, because, I, mean, I think we may be a little late, actually. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely pushing it here. I mean, you know, you see what's happening to fiat money just being printed everywhere. And we live in a sea of fiat money these days. So, yeah, we, we definitely need more competition against money specifically. You know, it's just it's just begun. I just was reading today how now China is getting on this thing about going cashless. You know, the, the states that want to go when you introduce negative interest rates, which is another way to do QE, it'll be QE four. when you negative when you introduce negative interest rates, there's a real reason people lose the reason to put cash in a bank. So you've got to. They just want to put it under their mattress because why put it in a bank and get less back next year? And so you have to keep find some way to keep them from doing that. And the way you do it is you get your economy completely digital, which is what's going on in Europe, in Northern Europe. And that's really all a smokescreen, a cover, so the central bankers can take interest rates negative, which they have in Europe. They're now minus, I think, 35 bips. And in the U.S., we just raised our interest rates from zero just a month ago, from zero to 25 basis points. The market has cratered 15%. I think they're going to be dropping interest rates. I think they'll be going negative, doing other, finding other ways to, uh, and so they they want they want to go cashless, but a, but I mean uh, to a, a form of digital security. That our digital monetary system that they, the mandarins in authority, can still control. That they can write something on a piece of paper and create 85 billion new units. You know? And you know that helps debtors. The ability to lower interest rates and continue to print money that helps debtors. And who are the biggest debtors in the world? Well, it just so happens to be the same people that have the ability to legally print money. You know that's that, that that's no coincidence. Is it? So with T0 now, you are trying to solve the, some of the problems that we, we just discussed. Um, what, what specifically does T0 do? What, what problem it specifically is it trying to solve in this financial system that you see full of issues? Okay, well, when you go on, I just gave probably a, a bit of a boring technical talk about the back office of Wall Street. I thought it was fascinating. Well, thank you. <laughs> You've got, and I noticed your T-shirt when I walked in. Thought it was a great T-shirt. Dance like no one's watching, and crypt like everyone is. <laughs> it's a great, for everyone to live. Yeah, it's a uh, when you're on your E-Trade account and I'm on my Charles Schwab account, and you sell me ten of your shares or something. Believe it or not, the back office, the plumbing that connects us, is is much more complicated. It's much more complicated than people understand, and there's much more costs associated with it. All of that can be reduced by a blockchain and or eliminated by a blockchain. Uh, and the different layers that I described in my talk can actually, not only are they costly, but they create room for various forms of mischief. And all of that can be eliminated by the blockchain, just like the federal Federal Reserve mischief can be eliminated by going to a crypto-based uh, financial system or crypto-based currency. So, Patrick, the point of the podcast, as I told you earlier, was trying to use the entrepreneurial process or methodology to create more freedom in someone's life. You know, I, I think of myself as a recovering libertarian. You know, I I donated to, for Ron Paul for a long time and made countless signs and put them up in my yard and all around town and huge banners. And, you know, I became frustrated about the lack of progress I felt just using the political process to try to create freedom. Give me some idea of how being an entrepreneur has created more freedom in your own life and possibly even in your clients' lives as well. well being an entrepreneur is certainly creates more freedom in your in one's life and that you work your own hours. Warren Buffett says, be your own boss. Work for someone you love and admire. <laughs> yeah, you got to love them by yourself, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, so there's that. And, of course, making if, if it works and you make some money, that's worth something, too. But it's actually uh, liberating in another way. It lets you self-actualize. lets you envision something and create it. And that's, that's really quite uh, a rewarding process, too. 
Yeah, I, I was reading a book, a small book by Derek Sivers just on the flight up here. And he said that an entrepreneur is able to tr to work towards their own utopia. You know, you have control over your business. You you get to hire when you want to hire. You get to network with who you want to network. You create your processes and tr you're like building your own little world that you control. And I think that was a really good point. You know, everybody doesn't need to be an entrepreneur. But those of us that want to build our own worlds, I think that the entrepreneurial uh, experience is a good way to do that. So Patrick, when, when I think of a successful entrepreneur that I want to uh, imitate, uh, you're one of the people that come to mind as a free market Austrian that's really success built a successful business. And that was kind of the point of starting our podcast was, uh, you know, how can we get interviews and talk with people who have done this before, uh, liberty minded, but also very successful in business. Do you have a mentor or an entrepreneur that you looked up to to grab ideas from on how you uh, shaped your, your business? Actually, my father, more than anyone, he passed away three years ago. He was an insurance man uh, by background, but he ended up as a great entrepreneur and very good at fixing broken companies, and that was kind of his thing, and he taught me a lot of the principles of, uh, of that, and f which include being you know, sort of ruthlessly tight-fisted, uh, but being honorable and fair and keeping your word and so forth. And I learned that all that stuff is half the game. And then the other half is, yeah, you got to know how to read balance sheets and, and do projections and things. But, but primarily, you know, it's like you opened the podcast saying what need out there wasn't being met. That's truly, it's, I think the general public might look at entrepreneurs like, you know, we're up on high giving orders to something. It's just the opposite. You view yourself as mankind's ultimate servant. You're trying to figure out what does your boss need? What is this thing called the public need? Maybe they don't even know they need it, but you're anticipating it and figuring it out for them and making life easier for them. So you view yourself as a servant to millions of people. So we'll wrap up here, Patrick, but what advice would you give to young entrepreneurs or solopreneurs or somebody that's looking to get into this mindset? You know, it's not really taught to us as children what an entrepreneur is. And that's one of the goals for this podcast. What advice would you have for those people? Set aside some money before you get married, because once you get married, I'm told, it's hard to accumulate wealth and you need to have set aside your nest egg beforehand and then you can invest it and that's what you use you can't it's hard to accumulate savings once you get married and start having kids so that's the big that's the big one yeah so wealth is definitely i mean capital is something that all entrepreneurs need you know, what what about the mindset of an entrepreneur like what type of dedication or persistence or oh assume when you start a company assume you're you don't have a life for five years it's all consuming it's all going to say goodbye to your friends and loved ones, and they won't understand. They won't understand that, and no one understands until they've struggled to make a payroll. They don't understand that while that's going on, it's awful hard to sort of pay much attention to anything else in life because, you know, you've really got the responsibility of dozens or hundreds or thousands of other people, depending on you, to figure things out. So uh, that's, that's the main. Understand it's a real commitment. What's been the most rewarding part of either building a business or getting into that mindset that you found for you personally? The private jets. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually, it's actually uh, money for nothing, chicks for free. Just kidding. It's the, um, it's actually two th having 2,000 colleagues, which is to say 2,000 families. Uh, employed and looking around and knowing that they're all, you know, that people have jobs and hopefully are happy and so on and so forth. That's a hugely rewarding aspect. Yeah, yeah we saw that you have like a 92% employee approval rating, which is unbelievable. Well, it's, I have sometimes, it's, I do, I do my best, but I do my best by them. And uh, finally, to do you have any asks for our audience or ways to get in touch um, or, or anything else? Sure. My email is patrick at overstock.com. Drop me an email. And uh, any business ideas, products you want to sell, we, we, have, we sell a lot of different kinds of things at Overstock now. So feel free to get in touch. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Thanks so much for listening to our Patrick Byrne interview. Please don't forget to rate us on iTunes, join our Facebook page, and subscribe to us on YouTube. Check us out at libertyentrepreneurs.com. We'll see you next time.